Welcome to a special episode of Web3 and Whiskey, a podcast about how the decentralized internet will change our lives. But we're interrupting our regular programming and the way we usually do this podcast to talk about FTX. And it's very dramatic and very public downfall over the course of really just a few days. I'm your host, Gary Liu. And as always, I'm joined by Suresh Balaji, founder of the Web3 Marketing Association, and Malcolm Ong, a product leader and serial entrepreneur. So the last three days have been an absolute roller coaster in the crypto industry, as one of the world's largest crypto exchanges has collapsed right in front of us. And it's seemingly headed towards inevitable bankruptcy and insolvency. And the ripple effect, actually, I mean, it won't really be a ripple effect. There's going to be a tsunami effect on the entire blockchain crypto web three industry. This, the situation is still developing in real time. And for, uh, for those of us who live in Asia, we have been waking up over the course of the last few days with crazier and crazier news. So frankly, whatever we say in today's podcast will probably be outdated by the time that this is published, but we are still going to react because that's what we do on Web3 and Whiskey. Speaking of what we do on Web3 and Whiskey, we also drink whiskey while we're doing it. So before we actually jump into the conversation, we're going we're gonna to drink a whiskey because of all days, I think we kind of need it today. So um, since we're recording once again in person, and I'm here in my uh, black hoodie because, you know, it's Black Wednesday in the crypto world, Black Thursday here in Asia at this point. Um, I, I, brought a, I brought a very special whiskey for today because, again, we're going to need it. This is a Strathyla. Now, this, Strathyla is a very old, relatively famous distillery, but its fame is not from people having actually tasted Strathyla before, certainly not the single malt. Because Strathyla, as a, a whiskey distillery, is um, it produces whiskey that is the base of Chivas Regal. Mm -hmm. It is the oldest distillery in uh, the Highlands. It is arguably one of the most iconic and most beautiful. And its single malts are actually absolutely delicious. But because it's the base of Chivas Regal, it's very rarely released as a single malt. Uh, this is a distillery reserve collection. And a, as you can see, my hands aren't giant. This is a small bottle. This is a 50 CL bottle that you can only buy at the distillery itself. You can't find it anywhere else. Um, this is also bought at nearly 58% because Strathyla single malt whiskeys coming out of cask is just magic. It is, the cask type is a second fill butt. So it's not super heavy on the cask flavor because of the fact that the butt has been used before. It's still taking a lot of the vanilla from the oak. It still has a lot of the sweetness from previous bourbon before, uh, before the whiskey and the first uh, fill of single malt. Uh, but over time, of course, it softens, the taste softens in the cask. So it's a 26-year-old Strathalla single malt. It's a single cask. Uh, because it's 50 CL, it's one of 700 bottles, only available at the distillery itself, never to be found again because it's a single cask. Yeah. As we talked about last time, single cask all taste different. So... For this special episode, we have a very special whiskey and goblets, goblets. by the way. Uh, what's going on in the goblets, Malcolm? You found the goblets and you found the goblets in our, in our office today. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Jackson. Pour one out for FTX. Oh, my word. Cheers. Rest in peace. Mm. Okay, we got to get the second sip because the first one's already overpowering. The second one really opens it up. Yeah, the 58%. Oh my gosh, so much flavor though. This is this is proper toffee. A little bit of moss, a little bit of dirt. Mm. Yeah, thanks for bringing this to the funeral. <laughs> I'm dressed in black. I mean, you guys aren't dressed properly. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, what a sad state of affairs, Gary. What's going on? Yeah, so let's talk about FTX. And I think before we actually jump into what happened, we need to talk about all of the people and the companies involved. Cause this is, it's kind of confusing to, to folks that aren't watching the industry every single day. So let me start by kind of explaining the major players. And there are two, primarily two individuals and then two companies and then several different digital assets, really one that matters. So the first individual that we must all know is Sam Bankman-Fried. 
or as we refer to him, or everyone refers to him as SBF by his initials. That's how famous he is. That's how important he is. He's just SBF, not Sam Bankman-Fried, SBF. Um, I mean, a brilliant young man who came out of just absolutely nowhere in just the last couple of years um, was, a, I believe, a Jane Street quant. And then in 2017, started a fund called Alameda Research. And this is just a fund like many other financial funds left Jane Street to go invest on its own. Um, And early on, they got into crypto and they became crypto first, crypto centric very quickly. Made a lot of money. And then in 2019, even though there were already a lot of well-established uh, centralized crypto exchanges. Mm-hmm. Binance was already there. Uh, Coinbase, uh, a number of big ones are already there. Mm-hmm. He still decided, I'm going to start one. And he started FTX. And FTX came out of nowhere and became one of the largest centralized crypto exchanges in the world very quickly, partially because of Alameda Research. Because yeah. Alameda, with all of its war chest of capital, provided the liquidity, was the market maker behind FTX. So from the very beginning, FTX just kind of blew up, okay? Over time, FTX became the far larger, far more famous company. And Sam, or SBF, kind of stepped away from Alameda Research and focused on just FTX. But the relationship between these two organizations has always been opaque, and this is going to come into play mm-hmm. in how all of this unraveled. Mm-hmm. Okay. Founded, both of them founded by SBF. Yeah. The relationship early on was that Alameda Research was the market maker, the liquidity provider for FTX as it was born. And then since then, kind of opaque, yeah. right? Not sure what the relationship actually is. Technically, no legal relationship besides having the same founder. But everyone knew something was going on there. Um, now, the second central figure... Mm-hmm is Zhao Cheng, Cheng Peng. Zhao Cheng Peng. I think that's, that's how you pronounce the Chinese name. Uh, or as everyone knows him, CZ. CZ was the founder of Binance. Um, a Chinese Canadian entrepreneur who uh, started Binance and hit the 2017 ICO wave and very quickly became and still is the world's largest, especially now, the world's largest crypto exchange. Um, now, Binance uh, played fast and loose in its early years, really fast and loose. For many, many years, did not require KYC uh, or, frankly, any of the normal governance that a crypto exchange like this should have. But because of that, and especially through the ICO boom, it brought in a huge amount of users and then a huge amount of the altcoins that were launched during, those, uh, during 2017, a huge amount of liquidity and became a central peg in the crypto ecosystem. Binance is huge. Yeah. They have, if we're talking, if we think, if we thought FTX had a huge war chest, Binance is multiple times the size of FTX's cash. Okay. Now, how are they connected? Mm-hmm. Well, CZ invested in FTX early. I, I think actually the very first round of external funding, uh, CZ put a big chunk of it. In. Mm-hmm. So at one point he owned a lot of FTX, um, only exited FTX last year for tokens, which we will talk about in a minute. Um, But now, because of the size, or as of last week, because of the size of FTX, there were direct competitors. And you had two individuals in CZ and SBF, both uh, referred to by their uh, initials, that were larger than life, Every time they tweeted, they could move markets. They were not always aligned in philosophy. In fact, increasingly became misaligned in philosophy. And they were challenges to one another's business. So two individuals, SBF, CZ, inextricably connected, two companies, well, actually three companies, Alameda, FTX, and then Binance. So those are the players. So what exactly happened? Let me throw it over to Malcolm. Because you know the timeline real, really well. Mm. What, walk us through what actually happened over the course of the last week. Yeah. So basically, as you mentioned, right, you have these two big players, uh, Binance being the largest exchange, 
uh, FTX being somewhere around number three, number four. Um, and SPF in particular, uh, he's known to be, uh, in addition to crypto, one of the largest donors um, in politics, yeah. particularly one of the largest donors for Joe Biden's campaign. U.S. politics specifically. U.S. Yeah. US politics, yes. Um, and I think, you know, maybe partly for personal interests and reasons, but of course, you know, uh, being very close to regulation, knowing that in order for his business to succeed, he needs to be kind of close to that. But I think one of the things that really escalated this um, competitive relationship between CZ and SPF and, and Binance and FTX was the fact that um, SPF has been lobbying, right, and pushing for more regulation in the crypto industry or for the crypto industry, but specifically in a way that a lot of people felt was very anti, you know, crypto and anti-DeFi, mm -hmm. right? And effectively moving things more centralized rather than decentralized um, and, and very, very, very much um, against kind of the ethos of the, the industry. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of been doing this, um, but there was a, definitely a certain point um, where, you know, CZ went out and basically says, hey, he would not support those who lobby behind his back. Now, he didn't name specifically FTX. It SPF, was pretty clear who he yeah. was referring to. Right. And so I think that's kind of like, you know, since, like you said, since 2019, they had this sort of weird relationship. I actually don't know why um, Binance was even able to invest in FTX. They're clearly competitors. So that, so that was interesting. Um, and you can say that that was Binance's way you know, in and, and having at least a foot in the door, um, which is a little bit strange to me. And they've always had this odd competitive, you know, relationship that kind of brewed up to, yeah. to this. And so once that sort of happened, um, what the, the other catalyst that, that happened here was that Coindesk um, breaking a story on November 2nd, right? So uh, last week, they basically claimed to have Alameda's balance sheet. Now, recall, Alameda was the company that was first started by SPF. It's the, the uh, market maker, the hedge fund. Um, and effectively, what uh, Alameda has been doing is it's been giving FTX or FTX has been giving Alameda priority order flow, right? So that, that relationship, even though it's a separate company, they've been given pre preferential treatment. Um, now, I don't know. I thought it was quite clear that something funny must be going on there. I think everyone realized there were lateral relationship there had to be yeah. right it's yeah. too it's too close to each other uh obviously conflict of interest has two separate entities yeah. but um uh, something had to be had been going on there and i don't think cz didn't know this i'm sure he did know this yeah. as well right yeah. so but when when that news broke um it basically said okay with the balance sheet um number one uh 5.8 billion out of their 14.6 billion in assets were in uh, FTX token, FTT, right? This effectively represents 40% of, of their balance sheet was in, was in FTT. Now, one third of FTX's trading revenue is also has been used to purchase FTT and then subsequently burn FTT to lower the supply. And this has been publicly done. Yep. Uh, SBF tweets about this every single time he does. That was the design well. tokenomics from the very beginning, which exactly. made FTT interesting Yeah, because it would be a, an asset that naturally should appreciate a value because yeah. it was being burned. Right. And this meant that FTT had a super low circulating supply, sure. right? Very, very much in, the, in, you know, large, full diluted value, but super low circulating mm -hmm. supply. Um, a huge gap in that ratio. And, and, and what you mean by that is there was also low liquidity. Exactly. Because there was low volume of trading. Exactly. So if, if you wanted to get out of FTT, it's really, really difficult. You can't get money. It's almost impossible. It's, exactly. it's pretty much, I mean, it's not a liquid, but it's, it's very close to liquid for the right. size of its market cap. Right. So effectively they were holding like, uh, you know, Alameda was effectively holding tokens three, four, five X, the value of the circulating supply that was out there. Yeah. So um, very liquid. Um, uh, so this, this, this Coinbase story broke out, right? Uh, at first, of course, SPF kind of downplayed it. Um, the CEO of Alameda, uh, Carolyn Ellison, she, she responded. She kind of downplayed it. She said, you know, quote, that specific balance sheet is a subset of our corporate entities. Um, we have over 10 billion in assets that are not reflected here. Right. And she went, even went out to say that, hey, if, if uh, um, uh, you know, if someone wants to basically, like, the, the thing that happened afterwards was CZ basically saying, because of these recent revelations of what happened, right? He, he basically said, we're going to start selling uh, and diluting our 
FTT, you know, amount. Yeah. So remember, they received a lot of FTT from their investment from FTX a while ago. And so CZ basically announced that he's selling 500 million worth of, of FTT. Now, he was somewhat friendly about it and basically said, well, I don't want this to affect the market, so we're going to do it over time, over yeah. a period of a few months. Right, so it's taking a, a friendly kind of stance on this. He knew exactly what, it, he but, was doing but he knew the exactly truth. because because of the way that it was um, designed and architected. And let me go through that a little bit. Right, so effectively, FTX. You have FTX creating this token, yeah. this fungible FTT token. Alameda has an opportunity to basically buy or front run the whole industry to yeah. buy this token, right, at a super cheap price or effectively like you know front running the whole, the whole thing. FTX then can pump the token, yeah. right? Increase the value, which then allows uh, Alameda to post that FTT token back as collateral. And so they're basically taking this token, yeah. uh, posting as collateral to then borrow against and taking uh, other assets, right? And, and real, real assets. And, and importantly, what you did mention when you went through the, um, the balance sheet that was leaked to Coindesk is that there was uh, eight billion dollars or near eight billion dollars in liabilities on that supposed real balance sheet exactly which would mean 14 billion dollars of assets yeah. eight billion dollars of, uh, of liabilities yeah. so let's call it six billion dollars net yeah. and they or they had six billion dollars of effectively illiquid ftt right. as part of their assets yeah. so whatever the net was between the money that they borrowed and the supposed assets that they had that net yeah. was effectively in illiquid FTT assets. It's, it's fascinating, right? So, so basically, they they took some monopoly money, and and they went and borrowed real money off the back of the monopoly money. Yeah. Yes. And they, they got real they got real cash, which then went onto their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And then it created this loop, this circle. They just kept doing it over and over again, uh, and that that's how they you know that's how Alameda was sort of propped up. Yeah. Uh, FTX was effectively the piggy bank of Alameda. Right. Um, and so that's that's why this was this was there. And so because of that setup and because of the structure, the only thing that that the one thing that could actually break this is, of course, is massive sale. Right. And that's where CZ and Binance comes in. Right. So the fact that they're basically saying, hey, we want to sell and draw down 500 million, that's going to cause, you know, the, the, the crack in this system. Um, so this is where I think everything started to unravel. Um, and as soon as CZ announced this, yeah. this is when, you know, speculation, FUD kind of spread around. What's going on? Why are they selling? You know, what do they know? Um, again, uh, the, C the CEO of Alameda basically downplayed it. In fact, she even said, hey, if you want to sell, we're, we're happy to buy it off of you at $22, right? Which, by the way, the current price today as of this morning is $2.50. Um, so, uh, so, you know, FTT started taking... Uh, shortly after, FTX was forced to basically pause all, all withdrawals. Um, and I think especially because of, of the uh, uh, experience that the industry has with Luna, I think it just sort of like made things a lot faster, made, made kind of the reactions to this a lot faster. And then that's when, you know, basically things started dumping. So that kind of leads us to, to, to where we are today. So, okay. Um, one connection that we have to make is why Alameda's uh, balance sheet and this, I guess, this revelation that it, it might be pretty close to insolvency yeah. affected FTX, right? Uh, the FTT token is a utility token for FTX. It's effectively a token that people hold on to to, to not have to pay um, exchange fees and stuff yeah. like that. It doesn't power much more than that, yeah. right? And but the reason why FTX launched FTT, just like pretty much every other exchange has launched their own native token, is because that means that they can print capital. Yeah. They completely control that token supply. Okay. Um, but there's not a whole lot backing it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's supposed to be one to one dollars, right? Because not. every uh, like the money that you put in yeah. to buy FTT and hold on to FTT, so I can get free exchanges. That money is supposed to be in FTX's reserves. So here's where it gets really opaque. And this is the, the, these are the details that will come out over the course of the following days and weeks that we don't know of right now is where all that money was. Yeah. And also all of the deposits that, I mean, I assume that all three of us had money in FTX and all the deposits we put into FTX 
Like, where was that? Was that actually in reserve as it was supposed to be? Yeah. Or had that been lent out as some kind of collateral to maybe Alameda, right, for them to borrow more? Mm -hmm. And is that why they were not able to fulfill the withdrawals? Now, one additional thing to note is that these native tokens of exchanges effectively act as equity. They're not equity, but in the market, they act as such. They effectively represent what people think about that exchange. So FTT's value, as it goes up, it means that the market thinks, oh, FTX is doing really, really well. If it goes down, it means FTX is not doing so well. It's not directly connected from a tokenomic standpoint. It's not directly connected, but it's just free market flow. Yeah. And so when FTT started crashing, it was a signal to the market that something's wrong with FTX, yeah. right? Um, and there was a bank run. Yeah. People started pulling their money out because of the Luna Celsius crisis. Yeah. And people realizing last time I got stuck with a bunch of assets in Celsius. Celsius went down. I cannot get my money out now. People still remember Mt. Gox, right? Where um, 10 years later, you still don't have your money out. You st like lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, uh, you still can't get your money out. So people rushed to get their money out. And of course, with all of these things, it's the big money that goes first because they're paying attention to it every second. Yeah. But the moment this broke on Twitter and things started going sideways, the big institutionals with lots of money in FTT or FTX got the money out leaving retail investors like us kind of holding the bag at the end of the day. And we, we I, I mean, we'll never, I, I'm pretty sure we will never get the money that we had in FTX out. Okay? So that bank run is what has crashed FTX is the fact that people decided to withdraw money. And it turns out that FTX did not have the reserves, actually did not keep our money, right? Safely stored away like a bank should. Yeah. Um, and so they could not, deal with the withdrawal bomb. So bank run, FTT collapses. Um, FTX is pretty clearly insolvent because they, they stop all withdrawals. And uh, there's a backroom deal. And two mornings ago, so uh, about 30 hours ago, it was announced that, um, that Binance was going to buy FTX. It's effectively it, right? Uh, besides the, the U.S. business for FTX, which is a separate entity, yeah. Binance was going to buy FTX. And Binance was going to take its own liquidity yeah. and save FTX and make sure that anyone who actually wants to get their money out of FTX can. But it was a non-binding agreement. And I think that when both Binance and FTX came out and said, here's what's going to happen, most people who know the industry did not believe it. Or at the very least, it was a, you know, let's wait and see what actually happens. Because based on the signals, everyone believed that FTX's capital issues were far worse than what had been revealed so far. That it wasn't just a couple of billion dollars. That was more than that. Yeah. And I've been talking to uh, industry insiders over the course of the last day and a half. And the number that I kept hearing was, CZ is going to walk away from this if the capital infusion needed is more than four billion US dollars. And it turned out it's double that. SPF has now gone out to market and said if we don't get eight billion US dollars, FTX is done. It's done. And after less than 24 hours of due diligence, CZ Finance almost predictably backed away from the deal and said, nope, we're no longer going to buy FTX. We're not going to save you anymore. You guys go figure it out yourself. I think this is interesting, though, because um, rumors have it. I don't, I don't know if it's validated, but they FTX approached OKX first before they approached Binance. Right. And then the CEO of OKX basically said, no, we, we can't do this for you. You should actually work things out with CZ and actually try to convince him not to sell down FTT. Right. Because it did seem odd to me that, yeah. uh, you know, first of all, they're effectively competitors and like mm -hmm. frenemies. Yeah. And they, you know. Um, in a way, I, I think CZ absolutely knew what he was doing, and he knew that if he sold down uh, FTT, that it would cause this issue. And so that was sort of like the last, you know, straw that that broke, you know, kind of the back of FT, FTX. And then he, and then and then coming around and saying, okay, but now you know, Binance wants to or can or is considering acquiring FTX, which seems strange. Yeah. Right? So, so let's actually talk about CZ's intent. Yeah. 
Does anyone want to make a guess as to what CZ was thinking over the course of the last few days, starting from the weekend when he first made that tweet to say that he was gonna he was gonna liquidate Binance's FTT stake? There was a bit of you could see a bit of anger, a bit of resentment. There, there was lots of emotions going on in those all those tweets, right? They, they were once brothers. It when when SBF tweeted saying Binance are going to bail them out, he said. Well, things have come a full circle. Uh, we are we are back together as friends, and you know this is the you know CZ was one of the early investors in FTX, and they're going to do this again. And they raised the hopes of everyone, people who are probably going to sell uh, FTTs, probably held off saying, "Oh yeah, okay, if CZ is stepping in, maybe we shouldn't." Right. So at that point in time, or even now, I question whether CZ knew that a the sell-off is going to crash FTX. Oh, he absolutely knew that. Or did he know? I mean, why did he have to wait to say that? Yes, I will. I will bail you out. Then go in and then see the books. I mean, what is the seeing the books piece, right? So these guys say that. Oh, we went in and because we said we have a non-binding deal, FTX opened their book to us. We we looked under the hood and all of this stinks. So we are shutting and walking away. I mean, did they not know that? The books were all being cooked. The, the reason why they wanted to dump FTTs were because they knew that something was going wrong. So here's my suspicion, right? My suspicion is that CZ is a very smart person. SBF is smart too, but CZ knew that you know FTX is in the position where they're at, um, particularly with SPF being um, close to the U.S. you know reg- government regulations, etc. I I see it as almost um, CZ being close to their quote unquote enemy. And allowing FTX to spend their time and effort with regulators in the U.S. Because mm-hmm. maybe as a Chinese person, Chinese company, etc., they're not really able to do that with the same effect. Sure. So let's let SBF do his thing. Well, he's pretty much on the wanted list for the SEC. CC is. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's let SBF and FTX do their thing with the U.S. regulations. We'll, you know, right. be arm's length and and kind of be frenemies there, right? And. Um, But as soon as SBF started turning against uh, perhaps Binance or even the crypto industry's um, uh, intents, right, then that's when things sort of to to, to sour. And the entire time, Binance has this like ace up its sleeve, right? Number one with the the investment. Number two, of course, with the FTT token. They effectively have like this ace that they can play anytime they want. And so I, I think he saw this window of opportunity. They basically said, look, we have an opportunity to do two birds, one stone. I can effectively take down one of my biggest competitors yeah. and I can make him look like the enemy and I make Binance basically look like the good ones, yeah. right? Because it's like, well, A, we have a fiduciary duty to sell this down because of the revelations that happened, yeah. right? B, SPF is now uh, fighting against the crypto industry effectively, yes. right? And, and doing what he wants, not what's good for the industry. And we don't believe that. We don't back that. Yeah. And so he had an opportunity to basically like, you know, play this card. And he knew that if he'd play that card, then that would be the death of FTX. So I, I absolutely think he, he absolutely knew this. So um, CZ, as he had to, send an internal email that was leaked to Binance, to all Binance employees, uh, saying that he did not engineer this. Um, that he knew that FTX was, was probably in trouble, which is why he decided that he was going to exit the FTT stake. Uh, but that he did not engineer this to be able to snap up or destroy uh, a competitor. He then, in the same email, also told all of his employees not to sell FTT, uh, and that you know the, yeah. that that uh, that actually Binance itself was also going to stop selling FTT. So Binance never actually went through with the liquidation. It's fascinating. So also here is here is an interesting thing about there's a nuance there, right? It it got leaked, and then CZ then posts the same email saying in full transparency. He publishes it on his Twitter to tell the world that this is what I'm telling my folks. So, uh, yeah. So here's what I think happened. I think I agree with the, the, the start of, of uh, Malkin's opinion, which is that CZ always had this ace up his sleeve. He knew that if he wanted to, sure. he could take down FTX. And maybe this was the moment he decided, I'm going to mess with them. Uh, much in the same way as U.S. always felt like they had a containment strategy for China. Yeah. If China rose too much, the U.S. could pull a bunch of strings 
and contain China, and they've started to do that. This was effectively CZ's version of it. But I think that CZ lacked the nuance that hopefully American yeah. diplomacy still has. And what ended up happening was um, he drove the industry to a point where even he himself, I, th like, it, I think he was surprised even he himself. Um, I don't think that CZ wanted this outcome uh, because as resilient as Binance is, and Binance is extremely resilient. Their, uh, their native token, BNB, which is their version of FTT, is far more resilient than FTT is because, first of all, it has a lot more liquidity, a lot, a lot more trading volume because it is also the staking token yeah. for their entire blockchain, which is called Binance Smart Chain, BSC. Um, so it has a lot more utility than FTT. So because of that, they're, they're, and their cash reserve, like we mentioned, is multiples of what anyone else has. So they are just far more resilient. Okay? But even, the resi even though they're so resilient, this is going to impact Binance right. for sure. It's going to impact Binance um, because people are going to have less money to spend, to, to trade, yeah. right? And Binance is going to lose, uh, lose revenue. Um, there are going to be institutions who are going to be out of crypto for years because of this experience. Yeah. There's going to be far heavier regulation that is going to impact Binance everywhere in the world. And, and then there's a lot, loss of trust, which I, I do want to get back to. And, and Suresh, I want you to talk about that. But I don't think that CZ wanted this. Yeah. And I think that he overplayed his hand without truly understanding what the tsunami effect was going to lead to. Yeah. And, uh, and right now we're in a situation that is beyond even Binance's control. I think the only crypto company in the world or crypto entity in the world that could come in and actually save this now is Tether. Why do you say that? Because they're the only ones who supposedly have the reserve. Yeah, that's true. Right? They have eight, $80 billion in, um, in market cap, right. right? Which supposedly is backed one-to-one -one in US dollars, supposedly. Yeah, I know. I love all of these supposedly yeah. backed tokens. Um, but anyway, the, the point being, there was supposed to be a savior in a really, really bad situation. No one really knew whether or not that was going to come through. It turned out it didn't come through. And now, over the next hours and days, we are going to watch FTX unravel, most certainly go into bankruptcy. I don't think they're going to find $8 billion anywhere. Um, and then that, if, that, that impact is going to start. And the economic impact of this is going to be multiples of Luna of the Luna and Terra crash. Because not only do you have yeah. much larger lenders yeah. that have lent money to FT or Al Alameda specifically, um, you know, like yeah, Celsius went down, but I think in this case, like, like Gemini is in real trouble, yeah. right? Um, there are like world-class investors, right. traditional investors. Let, let's take a look at this list who put an insane amount of money, FTX, yeah raised from institutional investors. I'm not talking about buying like their tokens, but actual equity raised um, $2 billion over the last couple of years. Lightspeed Ventures, Greylock, um, obviously Paradigm, and then we have Sequoia, and then BlackRock, Tiger Global, um, SoftBank, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, um, Insight Partners, they're all in on this. And they're going to be wiped out. Tom Brady, 650 Tom Brady, definitely going to be wiped out. Naomi Osaka, it oh, seems. Um, and then on top of all of that, FTX Ventures mm. has been putting money into pretty much every major Web3 blockchain startup deal over the course of the last 12 months. Yeah. And what happens to all of those companies now that the money isn't coming through? Yeah. Malcolm wants to go buy some of them for pennies to a dollar. So, so yeah. So mm -hmm. let's unwrap that a little bit and, and come back to to that last point. Um, you know, uh, I, I wanted to address your question, Suresh, in terms of like, uh, why did CZ uh, decide to try to save, mm -hmm. and why did he agree to this non-binding LOI? Yeah. Right? Um, was there an intent for him to really? save them and really acquire them. Um, I take a slightly pessimistic view to this and say that I don't know if they really wanted to acquire them. Maybe that, maybe it was a 20% chance where, where, okay, 
let's take a look at their business, see if there's any assets that's actually useful to us. But the eight, the other 80% was just, let's have an opportunity to look at their books. Um, you know, you basically open up the hood to our, one of our closest competitors, see how they work. Um, and, and use that as Intel in a way and use that strategic. So I'm not surprised yeah. actually yeah. that he then turned around very quickly, yeah. very quickly. Yeah. I, 24 hours. I, I expected them to never go through with the deal. I did not expect them to go this quickly and basically say no. Holy smokes. I, I thought they would, I, I genuinely thought they would go through the deal because I thought this would be consolidation. This would, I, I thought there might be code, um, ways of working, talent that FTX have, uh, potentially some of the some, users' some, wallets. Yes. Exactly, yes. right? All of that. It would have been uh, they, now Binance could have become this big monopoly, yeah. uh, the the lead uh, from a from a big distance, right? That's what I thought. I I genuinely thought 24 hours ago, uh, I, I was like, wow, wow, that's interesting. Now this is uh, where where my head was going was how who's going to approve this, right? Yeah. If you if you want to go through a big M&A of this sort, if you went into Europe, if if two traditional exchanges were buying each other or they were merging or somebody was doing an M&A, you would have to go through so many approvals, right? Well, there's no case, regulation. That's a problem exactly, right now. Yeah. Exactly, right? So I thought, wow, because there's no regulation, these guys are just going to put these things together and one, one fine day, FTX will get rebranded as Binance and, or other way around or whatever. So that's an interesting point, right? It's like, who's going to approve this? Uh, one fact to, to point out is that the, they, they both have entities in the U.S. that are technically separate. Separate. Right, so FTX US, Binance US, technically separate. Um, Fraction of their business. For correct, both companies. correct. So what we're really talking about is FTX cor uh, you know, corporate, which includes FTX Ventures, yeah. um, and then Alameda Research, yeah. right? So those three-ish entities, FTX US not included, and you know, they have another entity, FTX NFT not included. Um, so that's interesting, but, but I do agree that maybe what, they, what Binance could have gotten out of it is users. Yeah. Um, I don't think it was a talent grab because uh, interestingly enough, FTX prouds itself for, for having very little uh, employees, um, whereas Binance is massive. Yeah. Right. So it's a different scale. So very high, whatever valuation per employee, whatever you want to call it. So I don't think it was a talent thing. Maybe it was a market thing, right? FTX has a slightly different market than Binance. Yeah. Binance effectively is everything outside the US. Yeah. FTX very has, you know, very much the Western world in a way. Um, so I, yeah, I, I didn't have any confidence that this deal would actually go through, but I am surprised how fast it yeah. turned. I, I just, I can't imagine that, that CZ really wanted FTX. I, I think he wanted FTX restricted and knocked down a peg, but this type of impact again to the industry is not yeah. good for Binance. Yeah, that I agree with. Right. So I, I do, I believe that, um, that uh, him stepping in and saying, I'm, I'm willing to fund this, was him saying, okay, I won, right? And I'm gonna save this to make sure that we stabilize everything. And then he went in and saw the hole yeah. and thought and said, I can't put $8 billion in because then that puts Binance at risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Remember, F FTX did this with Luna. Yeah. FTX and SBF went and saved or tried to save BlockFi and Voyager yep. after the Luna crash, and they were the white knight. Um, but those were at a much smaller scale than what Binance would have had to do to save FTX. And I, I, I still think um, that, that CZ overplayed, took a look at the books, and very quickly was like, oh, okay, the hole is $8 billion. Um, we cannot do that, so I'm out. So that's the other interesting part of this story, right? Uh, and for the context of our listeners, right, it, it, during that Luna crash, uh, you're right in that SPF was this white knight that sort of came in and basically said, okay, we're going to lend – all these failing companies, we're going to give them a, a line of credit. We're going to lend them money. We're going to, you know, maybe acquire some of these um, and save them yeah. for the industry. Yeah. Yeah. But now that we know maybe the truth behind the way FTX was structured, it makes you wonder, like, was this them to save their own ass? Yeah. Or was it because, you know, because what else were the kind of like behind the scenes that they needed to do this in order to save their own ass? As opposed to them either... A, saving the crypto industry, or B, uh, buying companies up pennies from the dollar um, for future you know, investment yeah. Uh, returns. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, my, my favorite is 23 hours ago, Suju, right, becomes a poet and tweets, 
There I was, surfing the wave of waves. Next moment, wipeout. Board broken. Rocks, reefs everywhere. The sudden pain of business failure and loss of purpose as a golden child of the industry. Plus, business cycle more broadly was as difficult as the ensuing ostracization Th- this and is- demonization. Yeah. So is SBF the new demon? I mean, the last few days have just been crazy. So uh, Suresh is talking about the co-founder of Three Arrows, who has not been seen publicly and has not actually posted on social media since Three Arrows collapsed. And his first post was effectively him acknowledging that he's just been chilling and surfing yes. for the last several months, which is, I mean, it's just a, it, I, like, do you, like, zero EQ? I don't understand why that would be your first tweet yeah. since you destroyed $10 billion, maybe $18 billion worth of value over the course of a couple of days. And by the way, in the same day that this happened, yeah. Do Kwan I, was on a live stream and Martin Shkreli oh my word. was on the live stream telling Do Kwan that prison isn't that bad. And, you know, for those of us who actually believe in this industry, because we believe that blockchain yeah. and a decentralized internet is going to make the world a better place. I'm watching this stuff happen and I am just, I'm angry. It's, it's funny, like on the surface, but yeah. then when I pause and think about it, I am angry. Because these guys don't seem to be taking this seriously. No. They don't seem to realize what they have done to people. Yeah. They don't seem to realize that there are millions of people who has, have lost real money, potentially life savings, because they're so cavalier. Yeah. Because they were chasing opportunities to make money themselves, not being careful, again, riding hard and, and, and loose with other people's cash. And then when everything went to crap, they're still living their lives. They're so joking about it. They're, they, they, are, they, they, they are seemingly, at least right now, fine. Yeah. And that does not in any way, shape, or form match the ethos of what I thought the decentralized internet ought to be, what crypto and blockchain could do for the world. Um, but these are the poster children, yeah. right? And so one of the major implications and impacts, and we're finally going to get to this. Yeah. I'm going to toss it to you in just a minute, sirs. But one of the major implications, I think, of FTX going down yeah. is that the majority of the world is not going to realize that this was a failure of centralized financial institutions because FTX is a heavily centralized financial institution, and it's not a failure of decentralized finance. But because there is no nuance to separate those two things, the implications are, there we go. We have now once again proved, or it's been proven once again, that crypto is bad. And that is going to be the reductive reading of this situation, which I understand I'm not going to begrudge anyone for. uh, And it is going to set back the industry and the positive impact of decentralized technologies, I think, quite a ways. So the impact beyond financial is going to be huge. Yeah. Suresh, talk to me about that impact. Yeah, well, let's, okay, let's, where do we get going, right? <laughs> so let's, let's start with SBF's positioning, right? It is, it, this is insult to injury, right? I mean, your anger is because of the breach of trust and institutions run on trust and the whole idea of decentralization the magic of blockchain was going to be creating these bridges between entities and people where seemingly there was trust gaps. So let's unpack trust a little bit, right? Trust, you, you, you land up saying, you land up saying this is not where I was hoping this would go because there was, there was an expectation that SBF uh, exchanges DeFi was going to be the answer to all of the stuff of the centralized world where there was single point of failure. Mm-hmm. And there was a there was this interview in uh, Hong Kong FinTech Week, SBF live streams. Firstly, there is this all this grandeur of here is who this Saint Sam is, sleeps four hours, is a vegan, uh, doesn't take a salary, is all about his customers, is always doing the right thing. He was going to be the bridge between uh, CFI, DeFi, TradFi, etc. Yeah. And he's even asked, um, so Sam, do you think you will ever buy a TradFi bank? 
for its licenses? Will you be the one who is going to now merge these two streams? And he doesn't say no, right? He doesn't say yes either, right? So there was this whole thing about these guys are going to create this stuff, right? And he was, he was live streaming from Bahamas where he, where he still is, I would imagine, right? And off the back of it is this, this whole piece around FTX's brand itself. FTX goes into spaces where traditional investors are, you know, non-crypto natives are. So they go and you know, get stadium rights for Miami Heat at $135 million for a 19-year deal. Right? It's a 19-year deal of FTX being there. I don't know what Miami Heat are going to do if FTX goes down. Are going to, going to strip it By the off. way, that's a fraction of what Crypto.com paid for. That is correct. Yeah. Staples right. Center, or what used to be Staples Center. Yeah. And, there, and then uh, they do the you know, Mercedes team, F1 deal is the you know, FTX, yeah. Mercedes. I mean, when traditional marketers looked at these things and they went, wow, these guys have some serious money. Traditional brands got outbid by all of these crypto native brands because they were desperate to create this feeling of, you know, perpetual scale, right? And legitimacy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So there is, the, you're everywhere, which means you're prop properly scalable. You are legitimate because you are, you are being now, you are, you're next to Mercedes, right? One of the most trusted brands. You're at Miami Heat, one of the best teams. And, 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 and the sort of equity that got, that got rubbed off on the likes of FTX. My favorite of all, right? And I, I want, I want our viewers, our listeners to go and look this up is Larry David, you know, doing this advert in the Super Bowl and how this entire thing about Larry is being this guy who says no to all, all new inventions, the wheel, the bulb, putting the man on the moon, all of that. And it ends with, don't be like Larry, invest in crypto, right? It is hilarious. I mean, they spent millions and millions and billions of dollars. That was an FTX Super Bowl. FTX yeah. Super Bowl yeah. commercial, right? And they spent all this money to set this. There was the brand SBF. There was the brand FTX. All of these set to be A, the saviors, B, the ready for mass adoption, all of this, right? And then now this, the point that you make is very valid around it's not a ripple effect. It's a tsunami that you talk about. It is going to have a massive impact on anything crypto, firstly, which it should because, you know, bad actors have outweighed good actors in this space to start with. Second, and rightfully so, we've always maintained in this, in this podcast that we need underlying strong, stable industry policy, the right amount of regulation without losing innovation. How do we get the right kind of guardrails to come in? to be able to create spaces for innovation, rights for people, customer protection, all of that needs to come in. That's the second piece that, that one needs to think about as, as, as the impact. The, the third one, perhaps the, the most interesting one is going to be how much of the tsunami will have an impact on all things blockchain? How much of this will have an impact on all things Web3 and NFT? And no one knows where this is going. What could be fascinating is that $8 billion is found by a TradFi. And, and someone comes and says, okay, so maybe it's not Tether. Maybe it's a global bank. I, I, I don't even, I mean, there, there is a very small number of banks yeah. counted on one hand yeah. in the world <clears throat> that could come in with $8 billion in capital yeah. with what is effectively going to be probably at least a five, if not a 10-year return window to save FTX. I just, I, I don't think, I don't see it. I don't, I don't see it. I'm just conjuring, yeah. I'm saying, what are, what are the options now, right? I don't think, I, th what's I think the, what's the best possible scenario? Best possible scenario? For whom? Yeah. For, yeah, for, in, for yeah, exactly, right? For investors, for the industry, for blockchain, for Web3. I think somebody who has a heck of a lot of money yeah. and decides that they really believe in this world and wants to make a mark um, comes in and says, I'm going to save it even if I don't get this money back and I can lose $8 billion. And how many people in the world can do that right now? Elon can't anymore, right? Because he just bought into a money pit yeah. that he probably himself may not be able to dig out of. So who, who's left? The MBS? Binance was, Binance was it, right? Binance was MBS? It. I don't know. Another, you know, three-letter whatever. I, I think I need a three-letter acronym, or maybe not. Yeah, I, I, it's, that's not going well for, for those folks recently. So, um, I, I, yeah, I, I think it goes into uh, into bankruptcy. Yeah. 
and then we deal with the downstream impact. Yeah, I agree. But but this is this is let's get back to the point around the conversations we used to have around guardrails and customer protection. So where do we think, Gary, this will this will lead to? Clearly, SEC don't have jurisdiction on FTX in the Bahamas. Um, so in in that interview, Sam had Sam live streamed into. He said that FTX was probably more regulated than most TradFi banks. He said I just there are ninety how. plus lead regulators. Yeah. Ninety plus lead quote unquote lead regulators on camera. He says this, right? Now, which of these countries will take a view? on FTX and, and the big hope, right? When you walk the corridors of Hong Kong FinTech Week, everyone was elated, right? That Hong Kong was, we spoke about this in the last episode and everyone was elated that Hong Kong is taking your view on retail investors. Mm -hmm. Everyone was excited that, yes. And, and someone said, maybe Sam will come back to Hong Kong. That was, that's, that was the, not, not just a rumor, that was the, one of the drivers yeah. of policy, um, Again, in the in, in the alleys of government, was there was a realization that FTX, Binance, um, Crypto.com, they were all domiciled here in Hong Kong. They were either founded Crypto.com and 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 FTX were founded and 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 they grew out of Hong Kong. Binance was domiciled here in Hong Kong, and they all left over the course of the last two years. And one of the primary reasons that they left, actually, the funny thing is, there are two primary reasons. Um, one was the fact that Hong Kong did not allow retail investors on platforms. So they were just like, okay, we're not going to like, they, these are retail platforms. But the second reason, which we really didn't talk about last, last week that they left was that Hong Kong um, f forced all of these exchanges to heavily insure yeah. deposits heavily to the point that frankly speaking, it didn't make any sense because no bank was forced to insure up to the level that, um, that 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 these crypto exchanges were being insured up to, and had they followed through with that insurance, first of all, I'm not sure any insurer would underwrite it. Mm -hmm. Second of all, they would have to pass the costs on to the actual users, sure. and they, they, they their costs cost of trading on their platforms would be so astronomical, their business would die. So for those two reasons, they left Hong Kong en masse, sure. took all the talent, took all the money, took all the innovation with them, and the um, the discussions. Uh, over the course of the last several weeks was that, and I had heard, and I don't know if this is true, that um, SB had already said to the Hong Kong government that um, if there is a path to retail, if retail is available in Hong Kong, FTX would come back. And that was seen as a massive win. And I mentioned this last week in our yeah. podcast that that would be a huge win for Hong Kong to get FTX what and Binance back. Obviously, I have to reconsider. I don't know. I haven't had enough time to process what I feel about this specifically. Because, um, yeah, because we still need to figure out exactly what, what actually happened with FTX and why they were not able to pay out the withdrawals. And, and, and then we have to see how regulators are going to react to it. Yeah. What's going to happen to the Bahamas? You mentioned, obviously, Hong Kong FinTech Week last week and, and SBF being on screen. But you know one of the other... V VIPs that was here in Hong Kong for Hong Kong FinTech Week. It was a representative from the Securities Commission of the Bahamas was here in Hong Kong yeah. because they were trying, they, they, they are actually, I mean, they'd already, they've already sent out invites. They're trying to pull off a massive global conference in the Bahamas in January. Yeah. Is that going to happen now? Because the, the entire crypto industry in Bahamas was just FTX. <laughs> Right? So what happens now? What happens in Miami and the literally hundreds of millions of dollars that has been poured into real estate in Miami by FTX and FTX employees? So I think regulators over the next few days, next few weeks, including in Hong Kong where they last week gave everyone hope because they came out and they said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to open up. We're going to have, find a path towards retail. Everyone has to reconsider. But the last thing I'll say on regulation before we wrap is that um, the bill that, F, that, that, that Sam, that SBF, 
was championing in the United States, which is what CZ and much of the crypto community kind of was upset about. And by the way, Coinbase, Coinbase is, is also championing the same act. It's called the DCCPA. And this bill um, lays out how the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, mm -hmm. uh, the CFTC, would regulate crypto. Right. And this is part of the big problem in the U.S. right now, yeah. is that the different agencies are all vying to be the one that regulates. And we don't know who. We don't know if it's going to be Gary Gensler and the SEC yeah. or the CFTC, yeah. right? Um, we don't know if there might be a new uh, regulatory authority developed. Yeah. We don't know if virtual assets are going to split, be split into multiple different classes and be given to different regulators. We don't know because the U.S. Okay. does not have clear regulation. Is cryptocurrency yeah. a commodity or a security? Yeah, I mean, or yes, a currency. That's, that's the debate. Right that's now. the debate, right? Yeah. And so, um, so you actually have these exchanges that have decided the SEC is not our friend, mm -hmm. but the CFTC might be. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to support a bill for the CFTC mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to um, regulate, which by nature kind of kills DeFi because of the CFTC. Mm -hmm. And so that's why everyone was so upset with SBF and Coinbase for the championing of this DCCPA bill is because by nature uh, and, and, and frankly, by, by, by writing, it was going to be a massive threat to decentralized finance. Yeah. And so the, the expectation now, by the way, in the last 24 hours is that there's no way this bill is going to pass. No. So what does that mean? Does the CFTC no longer have a role to play in here? Is the, has the SEC by de facto won? And you guys know how I, feel, how I would feel about that, right? I, I would be very, very concerned about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We I, need to wrap. Let, let's make final comments on what we think and what we're thinking about and how our listeners should be, uh, should be thinking about this situation as of today, right? Again, playing out in real time. We will come back and address this topic and the developments later as well. But as of today, how should we be all thinking about it? Suresh, I'll start with you. I'm just worried that we will end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. My bullishness about blockchain is for all of the things that it can do. And we talk about how the decentralized internet can change people's lives in this podcast. And it truly can. My, that's, what, that's what I'm thinking about. I think that's what most of the listeners are thinking about. Now we will have to find a way of parsing out the good from the bad somehow and say, this is what is good about it. And how do we protect what's good about Web3? Uh, of course, you know, we here at the podcast are very bullish about Web3. So I'm very uh, scared about the implications of what this might have with the tsunami across the industry, not only because of FTX's, um, their own influence and their own hands in many businesses and many companies in the Web3 space, but like you said, in terms of regulation, what does this mean? But uh, who knows, maybe this is also, um, you know, one of those Lehman Brothers moments where okay, it's a massive crash, right? Massive change necessary, but perhaps this, we're going to come out of this and, and actually have a path forward that's, that's better. I agree with both of the gentlemen here. Um, I think the difference between this and the Lehman Brothers situation is that people understood what was going on with Lehman, generally speaking. Even uh, you know, normal retail investors had a, have a sense, have an understanding of how our financial systems generally work. And it could be relatively easily explained. This is different. Yeah. The vast majority of the world, they don't understand this world to begin with. And when they look at this crash, they're going to make so many assumptions that are incorrect. Yeah. They're going to draw so many conclusions that are incomplete. And my biggest fear, besides reputational credibility impact, besides the actual financial impact, which is going to be enormous, is that it is going to stop people from learning, from experimenting, and frankly, from caring. And that sentiment, I think, will really, really set back the, uh, the industry, uh, slow down innovation and um, restrict our path towards what I still think is a better world because of decentralized technology. So uh, let's hope that our pe pessimism is wrong. Maybe in the next 24 hours, there'll be some miracle and FTX will be left standing or at the very least, the impact will be constrained. 
Um, but I guess we're going to have to come back to this conversation again. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me on this special edition of Web3 and Whiskey. Thank you for sharing this beautiful Strathila with me. And uh, let's, uh, let's continue this conversation very, very soon. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, listeners. Please do follow us on all of your favorite audio platforms and hit the like and subscribe button on YouTube. And if you have comments for us or you want to disagree with us or argue with us on any of the points we've made, please leave your comments on YouTube. We'll be checking them. We will address them in future podcast episodes. We definitely want to engage. Thank you so much.